Okay. Well then, welcome everyone. Welcome back to the safety event. My name is Philip. I'm going to present today, as per usual, the cycline accident and incident report forms. So, just for you or for those who don't know, the ISA is collecting reports from all the accident and incidents that are happening in the second sport. And we, at the end of every year, usually around this time, we do a report, um, either a presentation or a written report about everything that we've learned from last year. And here in the presentation, you can see where you have to submit such a report. And I would ask you to do if you haven't yet. And if you've had any close calls or um, even worse, to just report them if they haven't been in the form yet. Now, for this year, I would want to do something a little bit different because what we've been doing so far is, as I just told you, is to do all those reports in a written form. Uh, now for the lockdown series, we've also done a video. And um, sometimes those reports are focused on a specific sport or a, spe or a specific discipline or a specific kind of accident. Sometimes those reports are focused on a very specific incident itself. But what we're going to today is um, discuss a little bit more about what happened in 2020, but not in a sort of um, interpretation or a sort of a, a data, a data analysis kind of way, but to look at each incident and see how it could have been avoided or how how things didn't end up going super sour. Yeah. And so what we've had so far in 2020 is a couple of different incidents. Here comes the 2020 cloud. And we've had one cut on the hand. We had, had one broken finger in a leash fall one broken finger in a catch, one dislocated elbow, one broken arm, one broken toe, one dislocated toe, one sprained ankle in a leech fall, one fall on the back with some neck pain for several months, and one concussion. And uh, of course, we aren't done yet with this year, and there's going to be more to follow. But um, for those injuries, um, I'm not sure if we can actually prevent them because some things just sometimes happen. You step into a piece of glass when you jump off your long line. Uh, you do a stupid catch, dislocate your fingers. Uh, the small things uh, just happen because people are doing the sport. Now for the bigger things, I would like to um, give you some insight in how to get away with slacklining. And it's going to be the 2020 edition. So let's look at the, the first big entry for this year. And it was a, a high lane uh, in an urban setting, actually, above a big crowd, sort of not a show directly, but um, to show uh, political support for, for a good cause. And the person that's illustrated here on the line was a total beginner, uh, has never been on the lane before, uh, never been on Helen before, and was really, really excited to go and try. Um, of course, they sort of slid out on the hangover, got on the line, tried to stand up, were really, really excited and maybe a bit scared. So they took their leash fall, and it must have been a pretty harsh one because uh, the person can't really remember what exactly happened next. But when they sort of came to it, they started showing first signs of having like a, a proper panic attack. So very accelerated breathing, sort of no clear train of thought. Um, they had difficulty getting back on the line. In the end, they couldn't by themselves. And they were just in a situation that was going from oh, a tough leash fall to being stranded on the line and, you know, really panicking and sort of um, slowly losing consciousness or fading out uh, because of having like a massive panic attack. And in this case, what saved them is they were just rescued by a friend. So one of the other people who were there, one of the other Highlanders, just very calmly came out onto the line, talked to them, helped them to get, you know, back to reality a little bit. And in the end, they rescued them off the line together. So lesson learned here is to never go alone and always have a good 
rescue plan on hand in case anything goes wrong. And even though it wasn't a, a physical injury here or um, a gear malfunction that went wrong, but more of a, a, a mental mental problem, you still have to be prepared and take the necessary um, precautions to save someone in case anything goes wrong. Now, on number two, uh, the second incident or the second major incident we had this year is uh, at the end of a day, very long day, sessioning hard. There was a lot of sun involved um, and just a, a lot of time spent outside. The team wanted to derig the line as fast as possible. So the last person who was on the line, it's again here, the, the smiley face with the orange rope around his waist, wanted to help derigging the line, but they were in such a, a rush or in, in such short time uh, to do everything they wanted that he didn't actually untie the leash before they started to derig. And then as they were um, derigging and taking the tension off with the soft release, the line and the anchor started to extend uh, with the leash still attached to him. So he was being pulled all the way away from the anchor and almost sort of fell and uh, lost control of the end of the, of the soft release and would have then most likely dropped a couple meters onto solid ground because at the anchors, the line wasn't high enough for the backup to work. Uh, so this would have been a very serious injury, but luckily one of their friends caught, uh, caught the, the problem and could then help them hold the soft release and sort of pull them back to the side where he could clip to the anchor for real. So in this case, someone uh, who was there, so also he was served again by a friend, but this friend then had the, the presence of mind to not be too rushed, even though they wanted to derig as fast as possible. So the lesson that's learned here is to always keep a calm head, have a good plan for how to do things in order, and really importantly, to never take or to never derig or take off anything that a person's life is attached to. I've had this happen to me a couple of times before, uh, especially on very complicated rigs where the anchor is super long and, and sort of difficult to see what's going on when you're derigging and one person is still sort of letting out the tension or passing the tagline over and the other people are already starting to, to take away all the anchor gear. Um, that you're left with like a piece of rope that you're attached to that's no longer attached to anything. Yeah, so I think this is a, a mistake that can happen quite quickly, especially if you don't communicate very well within your team when it comes to derigging, because after a long day of highlighting, it can always be tempting to just rush and go home as quickly as possible. But it's especially in those moments where you have to pay the most attention. Number three, the pretty straightforward uh, kind of thing, highland in a forest um, without sort of any official notification or permission or anything uh, shouldn't have been a problem. But for some reason, at this exact day, they were flying um, wood out of the, the forest with a helicopter. So they were taking, um, you know, logging equipment, uh, chainsaws and everything, and even like complete logs or trees that have been cut down out of the forest with a helicopter. And one of those logs almost crashed, uh, almost crashed into the line as the helicopter was taking it away. And uh, the people who were rigging the line then of course tried to get away as quickly as possible. And um, at the end of the day, uh, found the, the forest workers and tried to communicate with them because this is sort of their, their home spot. Um, when they would go uh, in with the helicopter and if they could give them sort of a kind of warning or um, get to an agreement where they would announce, okay, we want to highlight this weekend, are there going to be any helicopters and so forth. So this is something that happened more often than you would expect and luckily has never gone super, super wrong, but we've had many encounters where uh, airplanes or helicopters have almost crashed into sight lines. So in this case, what you have to do is to make a notum. So a notice to airmen. Uh, in different countries, there's different systems already in place. Uh, it's also something that uh, we talked about a little bit earlier in, in Austria. Uh, we had a case like this. And 
what you would want to do is with your community, either in a very local sense, like they did here with the, the forest workers together, or in a more more uh, broader community, like uh, for your national federation, um, or sort of the, the bigger area where you go highlighting, to have an agreement with at least the helicopter rescues, because those are the ones that usually get the closest to the ground and the closest to our highlighting spots that we sometimes share with climbers and canyoneers and so on. So always inform all the relevant parties when you go highlighting, especially those who can come and crash into your lines with a with an airplane. Next um, that we had is again a soft release problem and a de-rigging um, de -rigging environment. So here, uh, also on sort of a local spot where lines are kept uh, for a couple of days, um, a big, big water midline around 300 meters was uh, rigged on nylon. And after a couple of days, there was only one person left to direct the line, or more specifically, there were two people left. One of them had no slack line experience whatsoever. So there was only one competent uh, slack liner on, on site to derig a 300, water, uh, 300 meter water midline, which is in itself already a bad idea. Um, but I guess the situation is as the situation is. Uh, I, I will say that in the report, it said that he smoked maybe a lot of uh, Mariana, and this may have contributed to the problem, but I don't think the ISA should make an <laughs> official statement on this again. <laughs> so uh, I guess the accident might or could have happened either way. Anyways. So at the, at the end of the day, he wanted to direct the line and to show the other person that was also present how, how you could do this sort of by yourself. And luckily, um, when they set up the line, they left the soft release so that it would be easier to detention afterwards. Uh, however, the soft release was only uh, eight meters of webbing for a 300 meter uh, water midline that was rigged on nylon. So you can imagine that it would have been quite complicated to release all of the tension with only such a, sort, uh, such a short soft release. And in order to fix this, uh, the slackliner rigged um, a sort of tagline soft release that could also be used to release some of the tension and then it afterwards tag the line across. And while he was explaining um, all, all of the systems to the other person who was present, he clipped the the tagline release into the anchor, but forgot to clip it also onto the web lock. So he just had it sort of hanging on his shoulder and wanted to clip it to the anchor, uh, wanted to clip it to the web lock, but forgot about that step. And then after explaining a bit more, he started to release the tension from the soft release and noticed that the, the other system wasn't tight at all. Uh, at which point he tried to put a knot in the end of the soft release so he could install the other system, but there was so little left that uh, he couldn't manage. And all the time he was trying to, um, all the while he was trying to tie a knot or to somehow stop the soft release from coming undone, it just kept creeping further and further and further. So it was pulling him away from the tree where he was anchored to with his personal safety. And he was extending his arm further and further to keep hold of the soft release. And it was then when it occurred to him that the, the, the tagline he had uh, set up was sort of around his neck. And if he were to, if the second were to release right now, it was, um, maybe get caught on his head and then just rip his head off with all the rest of the second and, and the rest of him staying attached to the tree. Uh, fortunately that didn't happen. It just sort of burned here this entire neck portion of his head and ripped out a lot of his hair sort of up to the middle when he had to let go of the soft release. So this was like a, a mega close call. And again, it's the environment that sort of makes these kind of things happen. So it's not an equipment failure. It's not a sort of a freak accident, like being hit by lightning or some rockfall or other environmental factors. It's just having a clear mind at the end of the day 
when everything sort of is over and all the difficult stuff is done, you still have to pay attention to the small things, especially when you have big lines and when you're tagging. So the lesson that's, that's learned here is you just sometimes really have to be lucky uh, not to get killed by your cyclone. And this is something that that I'm always surprised with when I read the accident reports, like how often people get extremely, extremely lucky. Uh, and we would have we would have many more accidents and many more serious injuries and fatalities if people weren't so fucking lucky. On to number five. So number five is a bit of a breather after the last one. Um, I've inserted the official picture, by the way, that's on the website for who sells uh, the, the Snatch line grip here. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but as you can see, it's anchored with a line lock. So I don't know who came up with this or if this is a joke, but of course this system is not going to work because uh, you can't pull any slack through a line lock like this. Anyways, in the example here, they tightened a 80 meter line, I think, in the park to go slacker in it, and they had their pulley system attached to the snatch. And the snatch had the old version still, the old version of, of splice that just doesn't work, basically. And in the end, of course, uh, the, the splice failed and the pulley system sort of hit the people who were rigging in the face. No one was seriously injured, fortunately. But it, it's reminiscent of, of the accident we just had in Russia. But the, the lesson to be learned here is that you have to be very, very careful how you choose your equipment. And even though a line grip, or in this case, a snatch, is not sort of a critical part of the system, as in it doesn't stay in the slack line, it's still super important to have this piece of equipment be of high quality and be super reliable and safe. And the lesson learned here with a, a little shameful self-plug is to use certified equipment or at least equipment that is generally trusted within the community. And I'm not trying to, to bash on the snatch or the manufacturer of the snatch. Um, he's issued some, some recalls and offered solutions on how to improve the splicing. Uh, but in general, be very careful with all of the equipment you use, um, be it a line grip, uh, be it some some rope that you use, I don't know, to, to tie back your, your A-frame, for example. We had a failure in Switzerland uh, last year where an A-frame sort of exploded because it was really shitty rope that was used to tie it back. Um, even if the equipment itself isn't sort of in the main path of the load or isn't really supporting anyone's life, uh, if you integrate it into your rigging, it has to be reliable. And number six is the last one. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of this, or I couldn't find them uh, this morning. But in in the UK, someone rigged, uh, a permanently rigged a 100, 150 meter line on ground stakes. So one side, I think, was a tree, and the other side was on a hill on ground stakes. And one night, it was the, the wind was blowing super, super hard. Uh, the line got detaped and... Uh, they had to emergency derig with a knife. Uh, and the next day they found out, because at night they didn't want to go too close to the anchors again, uh, the next day they found out that pretty much all of the equipment was was wrecked by the wind, the ground stakes were pulled out. Uh, the, like the line wouldn't have survived the night anyways. And uh, the takeaway here is to stick around until later and listen to Philip Queen talk about what our wind survey and wind study uh, brought back. Yeah, so that's basically what happened so far in 2020. Um, I'm sure that Thomas can post all the links to the previous reports and uh, previous uh, presentations we did on all the other accidents. Right now, I think we still have some time to talk about uh, your questions. Maybe, uh, Navin, I think you can repeat your question because I already forgot exactly what you were asking. Sorry, otherwise I'll scroll up. And I think there's there's some questions about the recent incident in Russia that we can talk about if you want. But so far, I think I'll just stop presenting so I can see your questions. And thanks for listening.
Does anyone remember the question from earlier? Hey, Philip Naveen here. If you are referring to my question, I have just reposted it at uh, ah, okay. now, to go. But I mean, I can narrate it. Uh, basically, what what I is my audio all right? Yes, yes, it's good. Yeah. So what I wanted to understand is, I mean, many of us are trying to understand a lot about webbing because we assume that's the sort of weakest link of our whole system uh, when you compare it to anchors or web blocks, etc. So I, what I wanted to understand is, uh, we talk a lot about scenarios and situations of how a mainline would fail, but I haven't really read a lot about uh, about mainline failures, or maybe it hasn't happened in the recent past. So if it has happened, how have they happened, or what were the rigging mistakes that were being made? Uh, yeah, it's just a general sort of general question about mainline failures or rigging, common rigging failures. Okay, so. Uh, in terms of weakest link, I would say that you are always the weakest link in your highline. So the the person or the people who are rigging and setting up the highline, sorry, cut. <laughs> I know that was a bit harsh, but uh, the person rigging the highline is always the one that introduces the most mistakes. The equipment is often safe, um, but in in general, the things that go wrong the most often right now are wind. So uh, wind abrading either the anchors or the webbing when the lines detape, uh, or just, you know, generally introducing too much force into the anchors for them to hold. That's number one for sure, at least in the reports. Uh, then number two is abrasion from, from, from the anchor side, so from rocks or trees. Uh, that destroys the the anchor material, especially when you're using rope anchors. Uh, the stretch within the rope sort of wears through even thick protection. So if you just put, I don't know, a tree pro a couple times around the rock and then put a rope, the stretch in the rope will first cut the tree pro and then it will cut the sheath of the rope as well. And eventually it will also cut the rope. Uh, this is something that we see. So using lower stretch material might help in that case. And um, what else in terms of complete failures? I guess the next thing would be sort of complete anchor failures or where you have uh, whatever you attach to is not safe. So complete track, uh, tread anchors have been blown out Boulders have been pulled down mountains. Um, trees have fallen over. That would be the third kind of the third most often thing that goes wrong, um, in where you would really have uh, uh, a complete failure of your line. In terms of of accidents in general or or incidents where something goes wrong, the most often is then webbing slippage or someone not putting in the webbing correctly in the first place. So that's either not putting the pin all the way through, um, threading it incorrectly, uh, having a shitty tie off, things like this. So there we have the most close calls where it's uh, so usually sort of the backup of a backup that catches you before you fall really far down. Yeah. Thanks, Philip. Can I have a, just have a follow up question? Um, Any questions as you want. Uh, for example, I've seen in many festivals like DGBY or other festivals, uh, using hang frames or A frames has kind of become a standard, right? And uh, I understand this for two reasons. One, of course, uh, making a rescue would be super easy because the person would, who is sort of uh, injured or unconscious would be at a decent height from the ground so you, you can lower them onto the anchor surface. And the second reason would be maybe for a beginner or for anyone else, there are less chances of making mistakes while tying in or just while hanging around uh, doing rigging or anchoring. But in India, for example, a lot of our lines which have been rigged a couple of years ago and even now it's not much of a standard where we where we use the elevation on the anchor. So I have been thinking that if I, so I have never established a high line, but I would think that if I were ever to establish a high line next, should it be compulsory for me to uh, use a A-frame or hang frame for a long-term safety point of view? Any 
Any ideas on that? I think the the A frames, as you said, they're mostly used to make it easier for the people. So either in terms of rescue or in terms of access, that's what they're mainly for. They also, of course, help with abrasion because you put your anchor material away and have sort of the A frame as as protection. Um, so for me, the A frames make sense for lines that have a lot of traffic. So for festivals. Uh, where you have a lot of people going on and off the lines or for a show where you have a lot of sort of rotations between different people doing different things on the line, their A-frames make the most sense. Uh, if you want to protect edges, A-frames can work really well, but they can also, of course, fall over or fail. So as A-frames have become more popular, uh, we've also received more reports of A-frames falling over or breaking or um, just being used incorrectly. So I wouldn't say that we know that A-frames are generally safer for all lines, but we know that they make um, festival lines specifically easier. And even then, you wouldn't have to have two A-frames because you're usually only accessing the lines from one side. I don't know, it, it's a very specific uh, recommendation I could give, not something in general. Okay, I think there was something. I didn't really get what happened with the snatch line grip. Um, so they put the, they used the, the snatch as a line grip with a pulley system. And the, the snatch has this Dyneema rope inside that's connected with a splice. But the first generation of the snatches didn't have a good splice or um, what you would generally consider a splice. It was sort of half a splice that was tied back. And um, if you used it often enough, it would s uh, slip out at some point. So what happened when they were tensioning it is that the, the rope slid out of the splice and the pulley system came flying towards the people who were pulling on the line. That is what happened. Uh, thanks, Stefan. And Thomas posted the link to what you should do if you have a first generation snatch. Yeah, great to see you again as well, Richard. I think Thomas asked me a question on Facebook. Ah, yes, to talk about the, the other excellent web. Um, I haven't mentioned this as an answer to your question before, Navin, but of course, one of the biggest dangers in slacklining is just being close to an edge. Because once you're on the slack line, you're sort of relatively safe if you've done a good job at rigging the slack line. But getting to, so on and off, and especially at the very beginning, uh, accessing the line or, or even tagging the line, just being around the edge or being close to a cliff is very dangerous. And we had a fatality earlier this year in France where someone tripped over some of the anchor material that was lying around and fell to the ground. Uh, we've had an accident like this a couple of years ago as well, uh, which may or may not have been in relation to the Highline, but a Highliner died from falling off the edge. Um, yeah. I mean, there you only, you have to be as, as safe as possible and as sensible as possible. Um, and try to always be attached, at least when you're working, always be attached. Um, and when you're accessing spaces where you could fall off, you should, of course, always be attached. And this is also something to think about when you're rigging lines for other people to have sort of an access for them that they can use that's really obvious and easy and safe. Can you say something about the relevance of tape and taping in general? I hope you're not referring to our recent uh, adventure that we had. So I think taping could could be part of uh, Philip Queen's talk as well. So I won't get too much into why taping and different kinds of tape are important in, in relation to wind. But I will talk about what happened to Thomas and me two weeks ago. We wanted to find some location for a, a waterline festival and went to rig a 280 meter water midline 
and we had used the, the same line before for a different project that was a bit shorter. So not all of the line was taped. And the, the line consists of several pieces of slack line that have been sewn together. So sort of like, like you would sew together a climbing sling. So it wasn't loop to loop, but it was really just sewn together on top of each other like a sandwich. And because we had used it before, these sandwich parts were sort of randomly distributed along the line. And we had, uh, we brought some people who were maybe a little bit less experienced with, uh, with uh, bigger lines. Uh, and they did uh, the rest of the tape job. And they didn't notice that those sandwiches were just sort of all across the line. Also, of course, Thomas and I didn't check and didn't even think about this before. So I'm not trying to blame this on anyone else. Um, but the, the rest of the line was just sort of taped like you would normally tape a line all the way across without taking those, those sandwich sections into account. Uh, we then went to tag the line uh, across the lake and put some tension in it to see, uh, uh, to see how much we needed to be out of the water. And what happened is when we tried to, to put the webbing in the weblock, it wasn't super obvious which of the two lines we had on our side were the main and which was the backup because they were all sort of different patches of webbing. And when you had one, uh, let's say it was a, a moonwalk in the main line on the other side, it doesn't mean that it was moonwalk main line on our side as well because it was all those different patches of webbing sewn together. So we tried to pay attention when we were tagging the line, but when we were pulling on it, it looked like we had the backup confused with the main line. So uh, what we decided to do was turn it around and put the what was before thought to be the backup in the main line anchor and tension from there. And this seemed to work. Uh, so it looked like there were loops on one side, main line was tight, and there was a main line on the other side with loops underneath. So it all looked okay. We put some tension on the line and I clipped in with a hangover to see if it was okay. And what we noticed is that there was one really big loop uh, somewhere in the middle. And I wanted to go and check that out. So I clipped into the hangover and sort of rolled out into the middle uh, where I realized that uh, we hadn't actually put mainline to mainline, but we had put mainline and then flipped somewhere in the middle to back up. So we hadn't actually connected one piece of webbing to both anchors so far, and they were only hold uh, only held together by the the tapes that we had put. And normally they would slide, so you would notice. But because the the webbing was was sandwiched together in some places, it got stuck on the webbing. Uh, it got stuck on the tape, and the tape was apparently strong enough to hold three or four kilonewton that was on the line when I was sliding across it. Um, so technically. It was above water for most of the time, but uh, there was a, a good 50 or 60 meter section at the beginning where you were like 10, maybe 50 meters above the ground where I just sort of slid across and uh, the line was basically held by tape. Um, worked. I think it actually worked twice in the end. I'm not sure because we tried to fix this issue and then in the end did it wrong again and someone else slid out and then uh, it, it wasn't. It wasn't our day, to say the least. I think this is what you wanted me to talk about, right, Thomas? Yeah. So when you when you're taping, especially when you're sort of half retaping, it's always best to just start from scratch, right? Either you know perfectly well how everything is taped and how everything is worked, uh, everything works, or you just take all the old tape off, make it really clear what's the backup, what's the main line, where does everything go and then you tape. And this is especially true for sort of sectioned high lines, uh, because otherwise you might end up with like a middle section that has way too much backup or a middle section where both lines are sort of the same tension. This is what happened on the, the Y2K record in Norway, where Lucas had to go out and no one was sure if there was actually a backup in the middle or if they just uh, sort of accidentally put the same tension on both. Yeah. so. When you're taping and when you're putting together bigger lines where you can't really see what's going on across the line, you have to be really careful and plan it out ahead. Did anyone take faults? No, I, I only slid out 
and then I dropped into the water as soon as I saw that uh, we've done some shoddy work. Yes, what Thomas said. Have the taping done by experienced people and by the people who know exactly uh, how the line is put together and where it's supposed to go. Yeah, it's always a job that's sort of uh, delegated to the less experienced people, but that's not good. First, they don't learn anything, and two, uh, this is all usually the one that that gets fucked up. Okay, are there any reports about whoopee slings, soft shackles, or Dyneema extenders, since it's more common now? Not really. I think Yoshi can talk a little bit about the test that Jed did, maybe, on the soft shackle, where, where one of his soft shackles failed. But in general, we haven't had many problems yet. That's not to say that they're super safe uh, or a better solution than Quicklinks, but maybe they're just used less often. But so far, there hasn't been many failures with uh, soft shackles. Has anyone done a successful rescue across the Nema extender? I, I wouldn't know. I don't think so. You tried, but uh, it doesn't look like it's a nice idea. I had a discussion with fellow riggers regarding dynamic rope versus static rope for anchoring, but wasn't satisfied with answers and all different from each other. That, that's usually what happens when you ask any question to a couple of people in cyclining. You, you, you don't get any, any good answers. In terms of strength, it doesn't matter. So if you put like a, a three point BFK or three point sliding X with dynamic rope or static rope, they're, they're both going to be, be sort of strong enough. Um, benefit with static rope, maybe there's a little bit less extension or abrasion from the extension I talked about earlier than you have with dynamic rope. Um, benefit of dynamic rope. The anchors equalize a little bit better if you use a BFK because, of course, the rope stretches more. So if you're not perfect to begin with, uh, the, the anchor equalizes by itself a little bit more. So there's always pros and cons. But in the end, they're very similar and they fail because of similar reasons. So, yeah, you can use both. Or if if you do it correctly, they're interchangeable. Of course, you can you can rig uh, a, a stupid anchor with or a, an anchor that doesn't work with rope. But if you do a good rope anchor, then it shouldn't really matter that much if it was a dynamic rope or if it was a static rope. The distinction between the two just isn't that big. Okay. I think it was asked earlier uh, about the recent accident in Russia. Uh, we, we can't really say right now. We, we tried to order the slings that failed, um, having some trouble getting them shipped to Europe. Uh, we will test them, of course. We will also do some more tests about backup knots, so like tieback knots that catch long lines or trick lines. Um, we've had similar problems in the past where trick lines exploded and the, the backups don't work. Um, it's a difficult situation. We'll, we'll keep you up to date. Yeah, yeah, Stefan, long line backup tiebacks. There was lots of discussion about the failed knot. And if it's better to have the tieback long or short, do we have any test results about this? Not many. There have been like the occasional test where people just cut the anchor on the long line and see if it if it works, but there haven't been there haven't been sort of uh, any data collecting uh, experiments as far as I know. the The problem is, or fundamentally to visualize it a bit easier is if you have a hundred meters of webbing and you store a decent amount of energy in them and you want to absorb or catch all that energy in sort of a sixty centimeter piece of webbing, uh, that'll be difficult. So especially when you have lines with a lot of energy, either by them being very long, very high tensioned, or very stretchy, the more work you put in by pulling, 
the the more energy needs to be absorbed by your tie back. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of face you make, Cap. <laughs> if you get hit. Yeah. So maybe it would be better to have like two complete loops of rope tied together, so that you have I don't know 10, 15 meters of rope that will try to catch or absorb that energy. Then just a short piece of webbing. In terms of long or short, short uh, constrains the problem a bit more. So if something goes wrong and the backup works, there's less dangerous space around the anchor. If you have it long, there's more chance for the energy to be dissipated. So the, the backup has to do a little less work. But then, of course, there could still be people around close enough to the anchor to be caught by anything that goes wrong. And when you when you put a tieback uh, from the weblog, let's say just the end of the webbing that comes out of the weblog, you have to take into account that all of the rest behind that that goes to the tree can sort of whip Nash around. So it, it sort of whips to double the length of whatever backup you tie anyways. So yeah, we don't know, but we will try to figure out a good solution for this. Pool noodles. As in pool noodles around weblock and anchor. Yeah, that might help. That might help as well. Yes, what Ali said is length depends also on stretchiness of the webbing. If it's really stretchy, a long backup might cause more shock because it pulls for a longer time. So yes, the, the equipment will be faster at the time it is caught. So it will likely create a higher force in the anchor or in the backup. Um, so that's something to uh, take into account as well. <laughs> Maybe keep a line grip on the line forward of the block. That's very unlikely to work. Line grips aren't super reliable for, for catching anything. I, I wouldn't. That's just extra weight uh, you, you're going to shoot around. I'm not sure that the line grip will actually actually add anything. If you bring the weight of the line grip, just just bring an extra rope. That's uh, that's more efficient use of of equipment. Yeah, just generally stuff hitting itself. So Cat said, can't see much dissipation happening uh, with air resistance. Did you mean another mechanism? So. The, the line loses a lot of power when it uh, when it sort of contracts by getting ridiculously hot. Um, so it will be less, it will pull less strong once it's caught when it has contracted more. That's sort of what I meant. And you may also introduce more chaotic movement in, in the anchor itself if you give it more time. So things will fly in more different directions. Good. That's it then. When's the next presentation? Oli, do you want to maybe say something? I have a question regarding the airplane accidents. Um, what I wrote down if you have a couple of near misses, the accident will happen. So in, in ropes courses, it's mandatory to have a air traffic um, security line uh, if it's higher than 100 meters above the ground. Um, what are the measures to prevent such accidents in the future? So this really depends on, on where you are um, and the, the regulations are basically all the same for any type of activity, but they differ from country to country. So in the German speaking Europe or German speaking world, basically, uh, we, we establish a system. This is different for Germany, Austria and Switzerland, but basically we give out notifications to anyone who flies so the the lines will be in the the maps for the pilots 
and then additionally there's also some requirements for the slack line itself to be marked so this is probably very similar to what you have in your ropes courses uh, what we've been trying in switzerland recently is having big orange air balloons uh, next at the anchors so this is commonly used uh, when you have uh, telephone poles or other kind of wires that so you put big signalization at the anchors and then for some lines we also have an additional rope sort of above the slack line with some some flags and and also some balls and some lights especially if the line is rigged over at, uh, uh, if, if the line is rigged overnight as well so signalization and notification are the two steps or the two ways that we sort of try to mitigate this problem and of course never rig lines in places uh, where there's airports or where a lot of people fly through yeah and near misses happened because this was not yet established this system or to to a certain degree yes so in the beginning we didn't have those agreements with the air uh, traffic control systems and the the, the, the pilots um, so that was a problem sometimes uh, it's the military just flying in absolutely crazy places where you would never ever expect uh, an airplane that was one of the close calls in france and uh, not too long ago where uh, a, a fighter pilot flew his fighter through like a 60 meter wide canyon but you wouldn't really expect anything to go anyways um and then in in other countries it's just not as well known as it should be so the problem is coming up more and more so the communication from our side is also helping i hope um but yeah as as cycling develops it sort of has to reach a certain level because before we get noticed yeah, i saw uh, this video from pandi sukaro on sardinia where somebody um now establishes a line i don't know if you also saw it a very famous picture and i saw also one day uh, a military machine flying exactly there where this uh, line will be set up but i'm probably sure that the, the airplane would be lower than the, the line <laughs> one problem when establishing these uh, official notification systems that's now specific to Austria was um, the organizational effort, of course, to communicate with the traffic offices of the country and then also the cost. Uh, in Austria, like Philip said, we have the system where we kind of unofficially tell everyone that we know, which is the private rescue helicopter companies and the Bundesinnenministerium and so on. And when, then we hope that they, um, that they all see this and then parallel to that, we installed another um, like official where we officially uh, register air traffic obstacles. And that cost us like 500 bucks a year. And we had endless talks with the uh, traffic department. So it's not very feasible for most organizations, I would say, if they're in the early stages, but still they post the same threat like we do. And now this is kind of a dual system for us this is specific to Austria, of course, but we have our three or four legal spots that we can officially register. And then for everything else, we use the kind of unofficial system where we tell everyone, hey, we are there, please look out. And we also had the same thing happen with the near miss where we used our unofficial system or like semi-official system and notified um, also the helicopter companies and then the helicopter flew basically 20 meter next to the highland so in the end you always <laughs> kind of have to hope that, that nobody flies into your line that was the Frau hit maybe you know it in uh, also maybe something to know about this whole airspace traffic issue is that it's especially relevant for areas where there is lots of air, uh, air traffic and for Europe, you can clearly say this is the mountain regions. So it's it's uh, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, Italy, France. So these are the relevant areas where we have tons of, of helicopters flying around everywhere all the time. And um, even if you file in uh, 
this this uh, notification to the officials in Switzerland. Of course, you also have to pay money for that at uh, at a certain height. Um, so this is a big big reason why it is not done uh, because we have to pay for it. And then you also have to signalize, and you get like special. You have to sign a document, and it's very bureaucratic. You have to be early enough. Sometimes not realistic because of weather changes, so you have to change um, spots or something like that. So it's 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 a huge bureaucracy behind it. Uh, so this is one of the main reasons why it's not done so much. But uh, leaving aside all this official bureaucratic stuff, one of the key things which we will have to change in the future is signalization. So even though if you have all the documentation and all the official permits, you will have to signalize, right? But the thing we will really want to push is um, voluntary signalization, I think. So that people understand that we actually have to signalize our lines in certain ways. Uh, this can be anchor signalization for smaller lines. Um, so there's like the classic thing would be orange um, balloon type things that you know from, from other industries at the anchors. So the pilots, they, they see this and they go like, ah, OK. Um, this there has to be a second one of those orange orange balloons because that's what they're used to. And in between, I'm not going to fly. So voluntary signalization is key for the future, I think, especially for our like Alp regions and it's a bit different in other parts of the world. And then there is also um, for bigger lines, we will not get around parallel signalization. Maybe we can find some solutions for. Um, signalizing on the line itself. We have not found any good solutions for this yet. And one of the big challenges is leaving the lines up at night. Uh, because if you want to do this, what it means basically in the Alps, you need to put up infrared lights on the line or on a parallel line. Or you have to lower the line. These are the two options. Lowering the line usually is not an option. Um, due to different reasons, friction near the anchors and so on, but just having basically um, infrared lights is, is the next big thing. Uh, such a light can cost several hundred euros and you need several of them. So right now with Swiss Slackline you can get those for free. You can rent them from Swiss or get them for free for a project from Swiss Slackline and you can also get signalization material, but it's still not widely used. So this, I think, will have to change in the future if we like it or not, at least for our regions. Also, all of these lights, they're actually their prototypes. So this is a, like a produ product that was invented because of highlining. There's a company that produces those now. They are smaller. They're, the old ones were really big. The new ones are a bit smaller, maybe this size. And um, you can you can hang hang them on a parallel rope. Um, so this maybe just that you understand this. These are infrared lights um, because rescue and military fly at night here, and they fly with um, night vision goggles. So with night vision goggles, they can receive a certain frequency of infrared light, and they see these dots uh, in the mountains, and that's where they will not fly. Uh, this is the same kind of light that is also used near airports uh, on high buildings and cranes and stuff like that. But it's it's usually these are way bigger. So they produced some smaller ones for us. Um, and we are very glad to have uh, a company that produces those as a sponsor of Swiss Slackline. Otherwise, we could never afford them. But uh, so they supply us these lights and we send them back some, some pictures and some marketing stuff so they can use it in other industries as well. But just to say, um, yeah, I, I think not everybody has the possibility to get those lights, which is a big challenge to leave up uh, lines at night in areas with high traffic of military and rescue services, which will be the Alps mostly. So if you have any questions, you can also ask later or write an email. Yeah, so Yoshi just asked me if we can put on those lights in the evening on the line itself and then basically have the lights 
on the line during the night take them off in the morning? The answer is yes, we could, but I personally don't like it because these are actually quite heavy boxes. And uh, let's say there's like some wind or storm at night. I don't know how, what it will do to my line. And in the morning I have to go out on the line and, and take that light off. It's not what I want. So that's why for now we've only put them on parallel um, lines or parallel ropes to the big lines to kind of have the, the, them not as safety relevant and near, near our high lines. So maybe in the future there will be a system we can integrate into the high line. It doesn't exist yet. Um, but something we could work on and maybe even manufacturer could set lights. Yeah, so basically I just had a discussion with Yoshi, I was muted. Um, but one of the big problems with these parallel lines is also that you cannot set them up, up at every spot, right? So imagine like a, a ridge and uh, at the highest point of this ridge, you, you will have um, your high end set up and you will not be able to have like a line next to your high line. There's no spot, there's no space for that. So you have to choose, do you want to put like a line underneath or a rope underneath with those lights on it? So it gets really complicated in the details. And usually you can talk to the officials about how to place them, but it's, it's lots of work to communicate this. You need to find a solution together. They usually want, like one example for the 800 meter line we rigged, they wanted um, four of those infrared lights. So one every 200 meters. They wanted um, wind bags every 50 meters, and they wanted two big signalization, um, um, round signalization anchor points at each anchor. And so th this was doable for this big project, but you cannot like imagine smaller 150, 200, 300 meter lines, uh, which are alpine. You cannot bring all this gear. It's it's not it's not feasible to to do all this work. But in the future, uh, I mean, I can see in Switzerland it already has changed a lot. So people are not going to exposed places anymore. So like midlining has taken over in Switzerland and not highlining anymore. Because basically you can hide away in lower areas of a valley uh, with lower with lower high lines, so midlines. So you don't you don't have to signalize unless you're not you don't have to be afraid of helicopters that much. And you don't have to pay the fees and you don't have to do the bureaucratic work. So this already has changed our sport in a way that basically there's a, a movement away from these very exposed big lines to lower lines down in the valley, maybe protected by high voltage cables or by cable cars. So a helicopter couldn't even come there. So things like this, this have become normal now that people are not trying to go to exposed places anymore. Not so much. Some still do it, of course. And then it also depends. You just stay there for an alpine project and quickly do it, and um, or you leave your line up for days or weeks. It's a huge difference. And so this still has to change in the mindset of lots of people, also in Switzerland, that like. If something happens, it's either your life on the line or it's the helicopter pilots. If it's the helicopter pilots, um, you will be paying off your entire life and uh, not fun. 